Today is Mark 12, 28. The greatest commandment. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The sin is the reading of the Lord. Please welcome Steve Nevio and have God bless him during his service. Came and heard them debate. 
Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So, you know, it's interesting as we look at that, that scripture. A couple things come out to me as we read it. Um, the first is, uh, Jesus is actually quoting, he's combining two separate Old Testament scripture verses from completely different books. And he quickly integrates those into one one concept. He started with the first half of that statement is from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, which talks about loving the Lord our God. So Jesus quotes it word for word. And then the second is actually from Leviticus, verse uh, chapter 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, this, so. When I think about that, I say, first of all, we've got to understand Jesus really, he understood the Old Testament whole. I mean, to be able to be asked and to be able to pull from two separate books and combine them like that, Jesus really was well-grounded in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, and by doing that, I think he did a couple things. One... He built credibility with all those people who were listening to him, whether it was the religious leaders or the people sitting in that room, in that space where he was. He stepped back and said, wow, he just came up with that. And it probably got him to think a little bit. Um, and I think it also was a sign of his con continuity, of his mission uh, with, within, of his ministry within God's covenant with Israel. He tied it all together. The second thing that I found really interesting in that is, if you go back to what the religious leader asked Jesus, he asked a singular question. He said, which is the greatest command, the greatest command? A singular question, and Jesus' answers were the plural. And the second is. So, again, I, I, when I see that, I'm, I'm going through my head, why is Jesus doing that? Why did he just repeat the Shema, the first part of that, which all the Jews know? He connected them into one and said, the greatest commandment is this, is these. Um, I believe part of that is Jesus was trying to tell us that the second piece is actually integral to the first piece. How we love others is a really are how we love God. And we're going to talk more about that later on. But that, that was my first observation. The second is, it's the most graspable. I mean, the idea of loving God is a little hard to get our hands around. But the idea of loving each other, as ourselves, that's a little, that's a more realistic. We can see that. We can act that. It's more concrete. And I, and I think Jesus was trying to help us understand uh, things. And this idea of loving others is really, in my mind, the most important way of loving God. And I go back to a scripture uh, from Jesus' last conversation in the book of John with, with Simon Peter. And uh, they're having a back and forth. And So let me read that to you. John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus ends with, feed my sheep. So, I mean, Jesus is hammering this call to Peter. This is what loving me is about, loving other people. And in scriptures, when, when something is said three times, that's really like an exclam a double exclamation point. That Jesus is really trying to sink that home with Peter. 
Um, so, so that's what I want to talk about. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength? The first answer that came to me as I thought about that was, sounds like God wants me to love him with all of me. Not a piece of me, not a day a week, not a half hour a day, not just when I'm with Christians, not just when things are going well, not just when God's blessings are flowing. All of me, all of the time. A holistic, all-encompassing love, greater than any other love of our heart. Not just a fleeting emotion or a feeling. That's a pretty high bar. And i got to start by saying that really convicts me when I look at myself and say, most of the time, I don't think I love God like that. I, I personally, I tend to compartmentalize my time. Well, this is Sunday. And, or this is my devotion time, and then I got the rest of the day, I do other things, and I completely lose track of God. I disconnect. I get distracted by the busyness. I put other things first. I make God wait. A little example, and I know some people might say, well, what's that about, Steve? But you know, one of the things I've, I've got to happen is after 55 years of trying to develop some discipline in my life, um, I have a nice morning routine. I get up. Uh, I say my devotions, I take my wife and my dog in that order. My, my wife and the dog for a walk up to the coffee shop. I have my coffee, come home, get dressed, and have a nice bowl, you know, I head off to work. But you know what? When I sleep a little too late, you know which one of those drops off? That devotion time. Well, I can do that later. I still have my walk, I still have my coffee, and I still have my breakfast. So is coffee more important to me than God? That's what, that's what my priorities in reality became. And I think about all the other things in our life, whether it's Facebook or sports, video games, cell phones, our friendships and relationships, do those, do those become more important? So how do we actually love God like that? That's the question I've been struggling with as I prepared this. How do I actually love God like that? Um, and for me, I, I, I said, you know, Jesus didn't say love me with all you are. And the Old Testament version of Deuteronomy doesn't just say love me with all you are. It says, it breaks into those four pieces. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, you know, for me, I think, I'm, I'm an engineer. I like to organize things. I like to categorize things and break them down. And so... I said, you know, maybe if I start looking at those separate pieces, that will give me some better insight for that question. And this isn't any uh, precise scientific or theological structure I'm going to talk about. It's just kind of the way I think this through. And when I look at those pieces, and I want to talk about each of those four. So with all your heart, love God with all your heart. For me, the heart represents, I'm going to say the word, our moral compass. That, in my mind, that's our conscience, which is hopefully being informed by the Holy Spirit, our will, our commitments, and the decision-making part of us that decides between right and wrong, good and evil, myself or other people, and finally, my will or God's will. That's the, my, to me, that's what the mind represents, that, that, that heart, I mean, represents. Will we choose God's will or our own will? Now, in Luke uh, 138, Mary has just been told by the angel Gabriel that she's been selected to give birth to a child. And she said, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. She was saying, your will, God, is mine. I mean, that was probably a pretty uncomfortable thing that that angel was telling you. A bit wild, but pretty uncomfortable. You're going to be pregnant, not from your husband. You're going to be pregnant, carrying the Christ child. And she 
she said it. it didn't even again. She didn't even give it a second thought. Your will is my word. Let it, let your word to me be fulfilled. She chose obedience. She chose God's will. You know, sometimes we latch on, and I think it's a great thing to latch on to the unconditional nature of God's love for us. That un that no matter what we do, God loves us. But I think there's a place that. That doesn't mean we always bring pleasure to God. Sort of like our children, we love them no matter what, but sometimes they act in a way that really brings us displeasure. And likewise, there's times when we really get a positive, wow, my child has brought pleasure to my life. We're the same way with God on that. And so, um, we should be struggling. When, when I think of this with all your heart, it's obedience to God's will. Um, because from this, I don't, I don't think obedience and love can be separated. Um, Jesus in John 14, 15 tells the disciples, if you love me, keep my commands. Plain and simple. He just says that. So, so I mean, that's the mind part. Um, I mean, the heart, the heart part. The second piece, um, oh, by the way, not by the way, this is important. He promises us, right after that verse I just read, He promises an advocate in the Holy Spirit to help us accomplish that. It's not doable on our own power. We need to be committed to that. It's not doable on our own power. It's our dependence on the Holy Spirit to help us accomplish that following and that obedience. Talk about with all our soul. So for me, this idea of the soul is really represents our emotional inner self, our passions, our hungers, our desires, our affections, our enthusiasms. What gets you excited? What do you look forward to? What kind of energizes and motivates you? Um, and I think it's easy to see passion in other things. Um, as most of you know, I just had a daughter get married a couple weeks ago. Um, I told her I'm going to mention you in the sermon, so you better, you better catch it later. Um, so my daughter, Leona, something happened when she went off to college, and she came back a foodie. So uh, for those who don't know, I have to look this up, but what a foodie is, is someone, the definition, a person who has an ardent interest in food, especially eating and cooking. She's more on the cooking side, but she has this newfound passion for cooking. When we're sitting in the living room, she has TV on and she's simulcast broadcasting some cooking show. Um, you know, she's on Pinterest looking at recipes. On Facebook, she posts pictures of meals she made. And you know, just before two weeks before her wedding, she she spent a whole night making this custom lasagna. Went out, bought all these ingredients, and and she spent five hours making this lasagna for her family to be, or, or uh, in-law family. There's an enthusiasm. You can see it. She, you talk about cooking, she invents things. She, she's just excited about, about food. Um, same thing for those sports fans out there. You know, you, you, know, you know that die-hard Patriots fan, the person who has their Patriots shirt on everywhere, any chance they have to celebrate, that shirt's on. Okay? And the day before the game and the day after, that's 95% of the conversation is what happened in the game. And they know the bios of all the players and the statistics. And if Tom Brady came to South Hadley for a signing session, they would probably camp out overnight to get a personal selfie with Tom Brady. Okay? That's passion. That is passion. Um, and that's not bad, by the way. Passion is good. That's part of what energizes our life. But we need to ask ourselves, do I have a passion for God that looks like that? Is God my highest passion? Or is some other passion coming between me and God? Those are hard questions. And we each have to struggle with that and think about that and keep, keep things in a proper priority. And if you, when you look at that question, you say, you know, it feels like maybe my passion's kind of died down or it's a little lukewarm. Um, my wife and I uh, do a little bit of a marriage ministry here and um, and I think, actually, you know, a marriage relationship is about the closest thing in terms of 
thinking about this idea, how do I rekindle, how do I reignite a passion for my spouse? And I think a lot of these same answers talk about are, are insightful to help us think about reigniting our passion with God. Um, do I seek to please? Do I seek out and listen? Do I pay attention to them? Do I reflect on their qualities? The good things about them. You know, God's all good. He's got some amazing qualities, and reflecting on those brings us closer to Him. Do I spend one on one time with them? Do I readily apologize and seek forgiveness when things go off track? That's for marriage, but I think if we're talking about rebuilding a passion for God, those are all great cues on how we do that. The third piece, with all your mind, to me the mind represents our intellectual capacity. You know, what we think about, what we want to learn more about, what we spend our time thinking about. You know, I, I, some of you may have seen this, I remember it was in some magazines, you know, the picture of a, the mind space of like a 16 year old boy, you know, and, you know and, and there's this little tiny square in the brain in the cartoon that says study. And you know, cars, girls, everything else filled up the mind and the, the, the piece for studying was down here. I think that same thing, how much space in our mind do we actually have to God? Are we thinking about everything else but God? Um, it's also, um, where we decide to put our energy to, um, and how I use that intellectual capacity. Do I really learn, do I love to learn about God and His will? And that, that this word, you know, we have scriptures and we have theology. And theo is the study of God. Do I have passion to know more about that? Um, am I actually prepared to have an intellectual discussion with a non-believer if they ask me, what's the reason of your faith? Have I done some heavy lifting to understand to have a conversation about that? That's part of the mind part of loving God. Do I seek to understand the world around me from a Christian perspective? You know, sometimes some things are, are hard to work through. What is a Christian perspective on a given issue? How do I understand that? It takes some heavy lifting. It takes study. It takes learning. And is the study of Scripture a spiritual discipline that I've tried to develop? Um, I, and now I'm 55 years old, I finally read the whole Scripture last year, thanks to the help of Gary and Bill and my accountability group. It took us two years to do it, but for 53 years of my life, I never got through the scriptures. And, uh, and that building that discipline to get through cover to cover did tremendous things in terms of my insights, understanding God, and building up my faith. Um, 2 Timothy says, verse 16, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped every good work. Which I think is a perfect segue into the fourth element. With all my strength. Because I think the strength represents our actions. It flows out of those other three. What do I actually do with all this? What I think about, what my passions are, um, the decisions I make, it all comes out in action. Because talk is cheap. This last one in my mind is where the rubber meets the road. Um, you know, Jesus has the parable of, of uh, two sons in, in Matthew 21. He says, there was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in my vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted first? So we can say all the platitudes about our faith. We can say all the right words. I mean, the Pharisees were great about that. They knew all the right words. They had the head part. They had that piece. But in terms of their actions, 
actions are not communicated well. So, um, you know, Chrissy in her first, the first Advent, Advent message, I hope, she said something interesting that I think fits right in this. She said, hope is a muscle to be exercised, not just an emotion or feeling. I believe love is the same thing. We have to do it. We have to get out there to do it with our family, with the people we work with, even with strangers. That love is where the rubber meets the road. Um, and Christ is our model. I mean, you think about Christ's ministry. Jesus was active. He was out there engaging, you know, preaching, teaching, and healing. He was out there doing it. wasn't He wasn't just saying the preaching. He was healing. He was interacting with people. And, and so Christ is our model for all of us. Um, and uh, so when I think about my actions, when I reflect on my actions, do they actually reflect love for God? Do they glorify and honor Him? And that's in all spheres of our life, not just in this worship session. Um, it's in our work, our parenting, how we talk to people, our worshiping, and I would say even our driving. And this, this struck me, my wife in her car has one of the little fish logos on the back. And I powered her car one day, and I was leaving the, the, the uh, Newton Street Plaza, and I've been waiting for cars, and finally there was a little tiny crack, and I gunned it, and I almost I cut this guy off. Okay. <laughs> and I was proud of myself that I made it. And then this thought kind of hit me in the head. Why the Holy Spirit gave me a reminder? You know, there's a fish symbol on the back of the car. Did the person behind you actually think more of Christians and Christians of Christ because of the way you just acted? So this isn't, again, a Sunday box. This is our whole lives, how, we, how we're interacting. Um, do I do I make time to serve God, serve His church, and help others? You know, Dave just came up and talked about this opportunity of Puerto Rico to help some other people in the name of Christ. Now we all work schedules, and there's a lot of good reasons not to go. Um, but that's a, those kind of opportunities, that ability to put. Put our actions where our words are and get out and do that. Seeking those opportunities. That's, that's that helping. That's the serving other part of loving with all my strength. Um, you know, in Matthew 25, Jesus said, he was telling a story about a king. And he said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Um, that, this idea of actions, what we do, really matters. Um, and if we look at 1 John, 4, verse 21, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You know, we had that, early on I said we're going to get back to this idea of um, loving your neighbor as yourself, Mark 31a, Mark 12, 31a. That, that, really Jesus said, that's the biggest, not the only, that's the biggest part, that action part of going out, sharing our love, um, connecting with other people, being that conduit of grace to the world around us. <clears throat> so I've spent about the last 10, 15 minutes asking some tough questions. And I hope you don't mind. But I think that's the preparation. But now, now is the time to go forth, preparing the way for our Lord and Savior. Let us examine our hearts and minds. Review our calendars and checkbooks. Reflect on our priorities and passions. And where necessary, repent. Which is a word meaning seek a change of heart that results in a changed life. That we may love the Lord our God with all we are. And truly honor our newborn king on Christmas morning. Let's pray.
Lord God, we thank you for your endless love and grace. We ask that your Holy Spirit enlighten, guide, and energize us as we strive to make changes and prepare the way. Love you more.